go. Hey, welcome everybody in the room. Everybody joining us online, and I want to welcome specifically Porch, Boise, Idaho, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Des Moines, Cincinnati, all of the Porch Live locations. We are kicking off a brand new series tonight on God, looking at lessons from the life and stories contained in the book of Daniel. Standing firm in a fallen world. I'm going to read the text that we're going to be in tonight. It comes from Daniel chapter 1. If you have a Bible, you can flip open there. If not, it'll be on the screens. If you don't own a Bible, there's some at the Welcome Center right out here. We'd love to give you that as a gift. But if you have one, you can flip to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read all of the verses that we're going to walk through, which is 20 of them. So if you didn't have a quiet time, you're about to get one in right now. And let me start in verse 1. <clears throat> During the third year of King Jehoiakim and his reign in Judah, so the king of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it or had an invasion. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah, and he permitted the king of Babylon to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia, and he placed them in the treasure house of his God, or the temple of his God. Then King Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families. So all the royalty, or bring some of the royalty of the people of Israel who'd been brought to Babylon as captives. He said, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. In other words, the candidates for the bachelor, if you will. And he said to them, make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. So I want you to enter into an education program with these royal families or these royal men from Judah. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years and then they would be to enter into the royal service. Now Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to him by the king. So he asked the chief of staff for, for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who's ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief to look after Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days... Compare us to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who'd been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period was over, after the three years, they were taken before the king, to King Nebuchadnezzar, and the king talked to all of the men in the program, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom, and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the other magicians and enchanters in the entire kingdom. As I said, we're kicking off a look at the book of Daniel. And it's a book that contains what it looks like for the people of God to stand firm for their faith in a world that has fallen. In 2019, uh, in June, because Texas weather is always crazy, we had this storm pop up 
that was like eight minutes long, but like decimated this kind of area of Dallas. And here's what I mean by that. There's a video I actually took of the storm happening. It was a Sunday. This is from my house in our living room. And it was like an eight minute long storm. I mean, I had just gotten home, it was Sunday afternoon, I'd been gone on a retreat with some of our volunteers, and I came back in and I was like, honey, I got the kids, you go shopping or go do what you want, I got the kids. And she goes, and very shortly after that storm happened, and it was so short that I called her and I was like, where are you? It's like, you know, Armageddon has happened. And she was like, oh, I, what are you talking about? She had been in, you know, the, uh, what's it called, the changing room? She was in the changing room at like one of the mall stores. She was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I was like, you gotta come home. And I go outside and here's what I see in our front yard. This is the trees that have fallen. That's the street that my car is parked on, trees. And I walk outside and I look and then I look down the street and here's what I see. Where there were trees everywhere that had just toppled and fallen. Now it's, it's very simple and you know, you probably are all aware, how does a tree fall when wind or storm happens? And what keeps a tree from not falling? Well, it's about the root system. If the roots are strong enough and deep enough, then when the wind and pressure from the world around it hits, it's not gonna fall. But if those roots are not deep, it's gonna fall. And through this book, we're gonna look at what it looks like for you and I to have faith that stands firm in a world that is pushing against when the storms of life, when pressure from the outside, when pressure from culture around us, how do we be people who stand firm? And that's the entire point of the book of Daniel. It's a message that maybe has never been more relevant because today, holding to a biblical faith will get you canceled. Speaking about sexuality or God's definition of marriage will get you attacked and called hateful. Being someone who decides to date the way that the principles of the Bible inform you to may end the relationship that you're in. In other words, it's never been more important for us to know how in a world that is constantly pushing against the people of God can we be those who stand firm when the storms and chaos and turmoil of life hits. And so we're gonna look at the story of Daniel. Now, to go into Daniel, we need to set up, there's really four main players and an additional kind of villain, if you will. And so Daniel, when I think of Daniel and who he is, we're just gonna go play along. This is kind of how my mind works to read the Bible. I think of Zac Efron. He's a young, good-looking guy. He's uh, in the king's palace, so there's Zac. And then you've got the three amigos that are a part of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We try to think of a trio, <laughs> and this is probably as good as it's gonna get. Then you gotta go, who's Nebuchadnezzar? As you're gonna discover, Nebuchadnezzar, not a great guy. He's the villain of the story, if you will, as we'll see throughout the next week. And so when I think of him, I think of Joaquin Phoenix from Gladiator and just, you know, the ultimate villain. And so Nebuchadnezzar shows up, and we just, to recap the story we just talked about, he goes and he attacks Jerusalem. And he runs what's called the Babylonian Empire. Here's all you gotta know. The Babylonian Empire, at the time this was written, which is about 600 years before Jesus, was the world's only superpower. And it would show up and it would conquer lands. And no one could stand against the Babylonian Empire. And Nebuchadnezzar was a brilliant conqueror. He formed a kingdom that was enormous, that spread all throughout where the Middle East is, all the way towards Arabia and Eastern and Asia. And he would show up and he would conquer a land. And most people, when they would conquer, would just go in and they'd kind of set fire to everything and kill the men, take the women and children. But Nebuchadnezzar was much more crafty or intelligent. He would conquer a land, and then he would say, I want you to round up the top 10% in this group. I want the prettiest, I want the smartest, I want the most talented, I want the most gifted young men, and I'm gonna bring them with me back to Babylon. I'm gonna take all of the people that are the top 10% in your society and they are coming with me and I'm going to retrain them and re-educate them and attempt to transform or conform them to be Babylonians. And that's exactly what he's doing with Daniel and these men. And he does so in a really interesting way. You see his strategy for causing someone who's among the people of God to conform to the world which Babylon represents involves first, isolation. I'm gonna pull, Daniel had grown up his entire life. He'd only ever known Jerusalem. He'd only ever known Israel. And one day, he's ripped away from his family. He'll never see his parents again, never see his siblings again, and he's dragged 600 miles to the king's palace. He's isolated. Then, he's indoctrinated. 
We're told that he's educated. Hey, I want you to teach them the language of the Babylonians. I want you to teach them the literature of the Babylonians. I want you to put them in a program, Babylon University, if you will, where they are going to become and think like Babylonians. Then he gives a new identification. So we're going to isolate them. We are going to indoctrinate them. And then we're going to give a new identification to them where even their name I'm going to take away from them and give them a new Babylonian name. The name Daniel had means God is my judge. And the name that he's given is Baal protects the king. Hananiah's name means God is gracious. And the name he's given is under the command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael means there's no one like God or Yahweh. Meshach means there's no one like Aku. Azariah means God has helped me. Abednego is the name he's given, which means servant of Nabo. And then, on top of all of that, and perhaps most powerfully or convincingly, we're going to get them to submit not through punishment, but through gratification. So isolation, indoctrination, new identification, and then gratification. We're going to give these men the finest of the finest when it comes to food. They're going to be pampered. They're going to experience the king's private chef. He's going to be the one that's feeding these men. And very quickly, they're going to see, wow, life in Babylon is amazing. I'm going to be willing to conform to the standards of the Babylonian king. Now, before we launch in and see how Daniel was able to resist those temptations, what the king does is really how the world still attempts to conform the people of God to itself today. What do I mean? It still works through the same pattern, isolation. One of the ways that people end up having their relationship with God and relationship with God's people involves isolation happening in their life. You start dating some guy and all of a sudden you're no longer around other believers who are consistently speaking in your life. It's just the two of you. And then the people that you are around, you begin to be re-indoctrinated, if you will. And all of a sudden, sex in the context of dating, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody's doing indoctrination. Then you begin to believe uh, new identifications about what defines you and what your value is in because the world's constantly saying, this is what your identification is. Maybe it's your past. Maybe it's a sin struggle in your present. Maybe it's a sexual orientation that you wrestle with. And this is what identifies you. And then gratification. I mean, perhaps Satan's greatest offensive strategy is to get people to pursue pleasure, what feels good. Do what makes you feel right. In Rome, 500 years later, there was a saying called bread and circuses. It's a saying that in Latin was panam, et cetera, but it basically just meant bread and circuses. What does that mean? It was the Roman uh, leadership or the leadership of the country of Rome, basically those who were in power, said the best way for us to secure power and take away the rights of people is we will guarantee them grain and games in exchange for their right to vote. Then in other words, anybody who says, hey, I will give over my right to elect somebody. You can have an unlimited supply or a monthly supply of grain, and you can watch Gladiator games anytime that you want. And they saw that the people, because their desire for comfort and pleasure, were willing to hand over their freedom, hand over their purpose in exchange. It's the same strategy Satan does today, that he's trying to convince you to live a life that just pursues being comfortable, having pleasure, experiencing gratification. And that was the offense of the king of Babylon. And before I dive into Babylon, here's what you need to know. When you think about, so Babylon today is about 50 miles south of Baghdad, which is in Iraq. And I don't know about you, but when I think about Baghdad or I think about Iraq, I think about images of just kind of dusty desert and some of the soldiers that were part of the Iraq war. Here's what you need to know about Babylon. Babylon was closer to Miami than it was to, you know, whatever you're thinking of just a desert. It was an incredible city. It was, the most, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Some of the ruins today where you can still see, this was constructed hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth. Nebuchadnezzar was a master builder. There's one of the temples of Babylon. They had a gate. There's one of the lions of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar had constructed. There was a gate called the Gate of Ishtar right there, which is the gate of the gods. It's the primary gate of the city of Israel. It's beautiful. It was majestic. It was 75 feet tall. So Daniel walks into the city that is nothing like anything he's ever seen with all of the pressure to conform. And he's going to give us what is required to stand firm for your faith in a fallen world. So I want to walk back through two things quickly 
that we see from the example of the life of Daniel. The first thing that is required in order to stand firm is that we stand firm through preparation. Daniel, we're told, the king says, hey, I want to give you food. You get the private chef. I want you to eat it. And we're told in verse 8, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to him by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. What's going on there? What's wrong with the meat and the wine? It's happening. Well, Daniel was Jewish, and he had grown up being instructed in the law of God. And he knew that there were certain foods that Jewish people were to eat and certain ones that they weren't, certain foods that were kosher. And there were also foods that a king of a foreign country would eat that were sacrificed to foreign idols or foreign gods. And God commanded that you were to not eat of any food that had been sacrificed to foreign gods, which is why he says it's unacceptable. How did Daniel know in the moment to say, look, you can give me a new house, you can give me a new salary or job, you could change my name, you can change where I live, but I am not going to let you push me across the line if it violates what the Bible teaches. Now, Daniel was under the Old Covenant, which food is not applicable to us anymore. To us, it would look differently. But he knew the Bible, and he knew the instructions of God, and he had made up his mind, hey, you can take my name, you can take a lot of things, but I will not do that. When it comes down to it, no matter what it costs me, I am making the decision. I will not eat that food. I will not violate the law of God. How did he know it violated the law of God? It's pretty simple. He had to know the law of God. And Daniel has spent time in his home or spent time familiarizing himself with the law of God. And so he was able to detect, hey, I'm okay with this. God doesn't say anything about changing names. That's fine. I won't eat that. That he was familiar with the instructions of God and he decided no matter what it costs me, no matter if they kill me, I am taking a stand which required him to know the Bible, to know the instructions of God, to know what was prohibited and what wasn't. When you go to the airport, you walk through what is basically security checkpoints and TSA, and there's certain lists that TSA has. If you haven't been to an airport in a while, hopefully everybody in here has, but you go through a security checkpoint, and if you have something that's on the prohibited list, then they will either ask you to remove it or not allow you to continue to pass through. I was a couple years ago traveling with a friend and he had accidentally brought a pocket knife along with him that they quickly, through the security, in the x-ray, identified, hey, this is on the prohibited list. And so you have a choice. We're either gonna throw it away, you're gonna put it in your car, but you're actually at risk of a significant fine for even having it in here. Why? Because it's on the list of prohibited things. Daniel had known the scriptures enough to know Hey, this is on the list of what is prohibited. Part of the decision you're going to have to make if you want to stand firm, and I don't just mean today, I mean for the rest of your life. I mean when you're raising children. I mean when you are living with your spouse. I mean just in general in society. Is how are you doing it preparing and knowing what God teaches? Well, you're not making the decision on how far you're going to go sexually when the two of you are laying in the back of her truck bed and looking at the stars of night and wondering, how far should we go? Well, you know, where is the line? I haven't really wondered this before. You know beforehand, hey, we're not sleeping together. I made the decision. I know beforehand, based on what the Bible teaches about being honest, even if it costs me, that when I find myself in a position where my director or my boss or my direct report is asking me to do something that is not true or is cheating or is fraud if I don't get the promotion it's not worth me compromising because I'm not called to conform to the world of Babylon or the world of Dallas the world of America I'm called to conform to the scriptures but for that to happen you've got to know and be prepared by studying and deciding what is God's word that you decide hey I'm not going to compromise when it comes to whether I'm going to be a part of a church this happens so often, young adults, many in this room, and I'm not trying to pick on you, I'm just saying it's going on, where you make the decision of, you know what, eventually when I get you know, to the point in my career where things slow down a little bit and I just don't have that much time and God says I'm supposed to be connected to a local church, but I really, I got a lot going on right now and I'm still trying to feel it out, that you've made the decision, no. When I moved to that city, 
or whether or not I feel like I've had enough runway or not, God commands that I be connected to a local church. So I'm not going to compromise and convince myself that it's not that big of a deal or it's not really that important. No, I am making the decision. I am going to get connected. When somebody asks me to participate, and I'm in the medical field, maybe you're in some sort of field where you're being asked to violate standards of what God says is where life begins. And you gotta make the decision beforehand. Now, I'm not just hearing it from the preacher on stage. I know exactly in the Bible where it teaches. Life begins in the womb at conception. And so if I'm being asked to violate that, I'm being asked to violate God, and I am not standing for it. Maybe you're a teacher, and you're being asked to hide something from parents or to teach something that you don't believe. In fact, that contradicts the Bible. And the way that you stand firm is by knowing, hey, if I am asked to do that, and I know what the scripture teaches, I would rather forfeit my job than compromise on my faith. And this is where Daniel was, where he was deciding, I'm gonna take a stand even if it costs me. And you know what he got to see because he was willing to do that? And you know what anybody who's willing to do that gets to see? What happened in verse nine, where it says, now God. Now, Daniel made the decision before he knew God was going to show up. I mean, most of us, we want to know God's going to show up, and then we'll make the decision. Daniel says, I'm making the decision regardless of if he shows up. And because he did that, he got to see that now God was causing favor on his behalf. I wonder how much of life I have missed seeing, how much of God showing up you have missed seeing because of an unwillingness to stand. And Daniel, despite all the reasons why he could have convinced himself, it's not that big of a deal, I'm 600 miles from home, king's asking me to eat the food, says, I will not compromise in my faith. What you gotta know is that the current of culture is eventually, it's gonna push against you. My kids, every summer we go to a hotel Hilton Anatole, which is a hotel here in Dallas that basically has a water park. And my kids love it. And for a few days we'll go there and we'll basically hang out and go through the lazy river. What's a lazy river? In case you've never been to a water park. And the same people that never been to an airport. A lazy river is basically a river that uh, is water in a stream that goes around in a circle and kind of takes some turns. And it's water that is pushing in one direction. In order for you to move in the direction of the current of the lazy river, you don't have to do anything other than lift your legs. You lean on the tube, you lift your legs, it's going to push you. Whether or not you want to go with the direction it is pushing, if you don't have your feet on the ground, it is going to push you. But if you will stand up and stand firm, you can move against the current. And Daniel knew. I'm gonna to have to make the decision. If I don't proactively decide, I am going to stand for what God says in his word, which means I gotta know it, which means I gotta sit down and say, I will not cross over these things. If I'm asked to go cross a line and violate my conscience at a happy hour, at a strip club, in my work environment, I am leaving. There's not a paycheck big enough in the world for a seared conscience. And Daniel had made that decision. But without standing up, you'll just be pushed along with the current of culture. The next thing we see is Daniel standing firm after through preparation, through application. It says this, verse 11. Daniel spoke with the attendant appointed, and he said, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. So the guy tests him, and at the end of the 10 days, comes back and said that they were healthy and they looked better than the other men. They made the decision and then they acted out and decided to eat differently. Your translation may have that they were more uh, fatter than the other men, which to me just says God is all over this because this is the only time in the world somebody eats vegetables and water and gains weight. But at that time, it was a positive thing because they wanted people to have weight on. That'd be a sign that they were being well cared for in the society. But Daniel makes a decision Hey, I'm not going to eat that, and I will eat this. In other words, I'm going to do something different. As a reflection of my faith, and to not violate God's word, I am going to live differently, eat differently than the rest of these other men. He models the second portion 
of standing firm. It doesn't just require preparation and knowing when the moment comes. It requires application. And he decides, hey, I'm going to eat differently than these other men, as, long, as well as Hananiah, Mishaiah, Azariah, that we're going to live differently. They lived out their faith, and they put it into action. They knew, and this is true today, if you want to make a difference in the world, you have got to live different than the world. If you want to make a difference for Jesus in your life, you have got to live different because of Jesus through your life. And they took that faith, and they put it into action. And I'm going to live differently. For us, it's not eating differently, but it is living differently, dating differently, serving differently, giving differently, out of an application of our faith. You know what's interesting? Faith that's not applied doesn't make a difference. And I'm not saying it doesn't, you're not going to heaven. I'm saying it doesn't make any difference on how you live, and it doesn't make a difference in the world around us. Faith is like paint. It's kind of a weird segue, but what I mean by that is this is a can of spray paint. It's black spray paint. That inside of the can is really making no difference. The only way that paint makes any difference is whenever it's applied. In other words, paint that has not had an application is not fulfilling its purpose and it makes no difference. Faith that is not applied makes no difference. And it's one thing to say, man, I believe God's ways. It relates to you know, how I'm supposed to date, how I'm supposed to give, how I'm supposed to live, how I'm supposed to serve, how I'm supposed to use my time, how I'm supposed to not gossip. I believe all of those things. But when you don't apply it, it makes no difference. And Daniel and these guys knew, hey, if I'm gonna make a difference in the world, it means I need to live different than the world. And for them, that looked like eating. For you, it may look like dating, or it does look like dating differently. I'm gonna make the decision, I'm not gonna date like the world dates. How many of us in the room, if the world is to compare your dating relationships with some random person who has no faith in God at all, would they see the difference in how you treated the other person you were dating? How you pursued purity together with that person? Or would they just say, they must believe the same thing? Because you can believe all the things in the world, but just like a paint can that never sprays on, someone who believes things about love, sex, dating, marriage, that doesn't actually apply it, makes no difference. Some of us, when it comes to dating different from the world, you have been so conditioned and brainwashed by Babylon that when somebody treats you like a godly guy treats you in an honoring way, it's almost distasteful to you because you've been so conditioned by the world on how to think about love and dating, you like the game. You don't want a guy who actually texts you back when he says, I will text you or I'll call you or he actually honors you, which is why you ghost people. And while you feel like, oh man, I can't text her back too soon because then she's gonna think like I'm desperate over here, you bought the lie and you have been brainwashed by Babylon. And you may not believe me, but that is the truth. And so even the fact that you're somewhat resistant and I'm uncomfortable and this is kind of bizarre and he like, you know, didn't actually try to put his hands up my clothes is bizarre to you because Babylon's brainwashing worked. And if you're in that place, God loves you. He wants to continue to transform your mind, not conform you to the world around you, Romans 12 says. But it starts by you acknowledging, man, there is something where I have conformed to the way that society tells me to think. And for you to take a step of application, it takes a step of identification and identifying. Another way that we're called to be different is not eat different, but to work different, which we do see in an example of Daniel and these other three men modeling out. Where Daniel, we're told in verse 19, was the best of the best workers the king had. That Christians are called to be excellent in the work environment. That you were called, if your boss was to come up here and talk on stage and talk about you, that they would say, he or she, I just heard, oh boy, he or she is one of the hardest workers we have. They show up early, they're polite, they don't participate in awesome gossip, they seem to bring steadiness to rooms that they walk into, they work really hard, they're humble. They're not the entitled generation. They're not a part of it. They're not the selfish generation, self-obsessed generation. 
that you're to stand out in the way that you work. Colossians chapter three says, Christians, Paul writing 500 years later would say, whatever you do, you are to work at it with all of your heart as you're working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know, you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward for how you work. It is Christ the Lord that you are serving, that you should stand out in the workplace. You should be excellent in the workplace. And Christians do so, not by believing they should, but letting that belief drive their behavior. Maybe the most God-honoring thing some of you guys can do is go to your boss and ask for forgiveness because today you spent three hours on Facebook and social media and blogs. And the strongest witness you may have tomorrow is by saying, that's not who I want to be, and owning it. And Daniel models, hey, we're to look different from the world. And you know what's gonna happen when you begin to do this, you begin to live differently for your faith? I just wanna prepare you. You're gonna be misunderstood. Your old friends are gonna come around you and be like, oh man, you're, uh, wow, yeah, I, sorry I said that cuss word. Uh, I, you know, I know you're big on God now and the whole religious thing and let me put out my cigarette here real quick and I'm sorry, I didn't wanna do that in front of you. And you're gonna be like, bro, it's so chill. Why are you being so weird? And you're gonna be misunderstood and you're gonna come across like you're judging people when you don't want to. And you're probably doing it right. Because when you stand firm for your faith, you're gonna come across and be misunderstood. You're going to come across in a way that hopefully is loving and caring and not trying to be misunderstood, but people are gonna see you holding to the values that God says and God has, holding to what he says about the definition of male and female and they're gonna attack you for it. And you're gonna have family members who think, oh, you're just so different and so weird now. But you gotta know, it's coming. Jesus said, when the world hates you, or when people oppose you, when people push against you, you should know they did it with me. And if you blend in with the world, if that's not happening, you should be concerned that maybe the brainwashing of Babylon is happening. And these men lived out and modeled and were a light in the darkness of the city of Babylon. They did what Jesus, 500 years later on a hillside, would look in the eyes of a crowd like this and say, as the people of God, you are the salt of the earth. Salt to us is kind of a weird thing where it's like, it's a flavor? What do you mean by that? Salt in Jesus' day was a preservation. What is he saying? In other words, there was no refrigerators. In order to preserve meat, you would put salt on it, and it would extend the life of that meat. He's saying, your presence in Deloitte's offices, your presence in the school district that you're a part of, you living in apartment 301 in Uptown, you being a part of that police force or part of that organization or part of that nonprofit or in that hospital, you being there is like it's slowing down the decay of what would happen without you there that you are part of the preserver of the world. And you don't think it's a big deal, and you don't think anybody cares, and you don't think anybody notices. No, 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 Jesus is like, salt always makes a difference. By you speaking like a follower of Jesus, loving like a follower of Jesus, being kind like a follower of Jesus, modeling dating well like a follower of Jesus, you are making an eternal difference, and the world decays faster without you. And then he says something really brilliant that also we see in Daniel in these men who just shine brightly. He says, you are the light of the world. You take away my people, those who live according to my instructions, and the world gets darker. And your heavenly father, in verse 16, like people don't put, verse 15, they don't put a lamp and light it and put it under a bowl. No, 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 nobody does that. Nobody's like, oh, let me turn on a candle, cover it up. In the same way, God doesn't put a light in a random place. They put it very intentionally so that it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Translation, God doesn't put lights in random places. And you are in an environment right now, let me say, there are some of you that tomorrow you're gonna wake up And you're gonna go to a mission field that's one of the least mission opportunities in the world. 
And it's not that you're gonna get on a plane and go to Venezuela or get on a plane and go to Africa. It's that you're gonna go to the ninth floor of a building and you're gonna have clearance to get in there and you're gonna report to different men and women of corporate American positions that most of the room will never have an opportunity to model a light for. Some of you are gonna go to teaching or go to classrooms and you're gonna teach kids of all kinds of ethnic backgrounds and you're gonna look them in the eye and you're gonna treat them differently than other teachers because you are the salt of the earth. And salt always makes a difference when it stands firm. In conclusion, the way that we stand firm is by preparation beforehand and then by application in the moment. Daniel, as we're gonna see over and over models this idea of standing firm, but the Bible tells us the ultimate example of standing firm in the face of when it costs you, in the face of when people attack you for it, was not Daniel. It was Jesus. Peter would write 500 years later, and he writes to men and women who are being attacked for their faith, attacked for their beliefs in Christ. And he says, remember your example. This is 1 Peter chapter two, I'm closing. If you suffer for good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you would follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And Peter says, you follow in the footsteps of your Savior, who in the face of a world that misunderstood him, that attacked him and called him insulting names for what he had done, that he stood and eventually was crucified for you, for me, for anyone who would accept and believe in him. And this is what the gospel and this is what Christianity teaches that the only way that we stand firm at any point is by first accepting that we are unwilling and unable to stand before a perfect God who came in the form of Jesus and gave his life on a cross for you and died for everything in your past, everything in your present, everything in your future. And anyone who accepts him as payment for their sin, you died for me, God. You lived, you were crucified, and you came back alive, and I believe that, and I believe I'll have eternal life, not because of how good I am or how steadfast I am at work, how nice I am, but because of what you have done for me has eternal life and as the means by which they can have the Spirit of God strengthen their ability to, in this life, stand firm in a fallen world. And that God is the God of Daniel, and he's the God we worship. And he's the God who gave his life for you, for me, for all who would receive him. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the men and women in this room who have accepted that free gift and they've allowed just the truths and the conviction from your spirit to continue to move them in the direction of living in accordance with your word and your way. I pray that you would give them favor. I pray that tomorrow at work, men and women would honor you and the way that they speak, interact, work hard, work humbly. I pray that dating relationships would not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but would be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and they would showcase to a watching world, there is something different. Would you strengthen us, God? There is so much attack, so much persecution, so much noise in the world around us that is trying to get Christians to not be courageous, trying to get Christians to compromise, trying to get Christians to not look like Christ. Would you help us, God? We worship you now in song. Amen.